Good afternoon, everyone. This is Community Chats once again. I'm your host, Sandra Arevalo, Director of Community Health and Wellness at Montefiore Nyack Hospital. And today we're going to be talking about babies, heads, shapes, very complicated. But Dr. Andrew Kovitz is here with us to make it more simple and explain to us what this all means. So don't be scared. We're going to learn about this, and definitely he uh, is an expert, and just um, maybe Dr. Kovitz, you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your career, how you got here, just to introduce yourself, and he's an assistant professor, as you can see in the slide, of neurological surgery and pediatrics at Montefiore, in the Montefiore Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Kovitz, welcome, and thank you so much for offering to do this talk. I know we've had you before, and everything that you discuss is always amazing. So thank you for being here. And thank you so much, Sandra, for the uh, invitation. I love giving these talks. It's a really wonderful way to dispel a lot of um, myths and a lot of anxiety um, for parents and to just put them at ease. I mean, I think knowledge is uh, powerful for young parents and to know when something is urgent, to know when something's not urgent, it really um, alleviates a lot of the stress they have until they can get time to uh, get to a neurosurgeon or to an expert that can just give us give them a little bit of information of what's going on. So again, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm an assistant professor uh, here at Montefiore um, of uh, neurological surgery and pediatrics. We have an absolutely wonderful team here at the Children's Hospital. And we see uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients um, every single year that have uh, a lot of issues in terms of head shapes. And some are benign, some are a little bit more concerning. And I guarantee by the end of this talk, uh, new parents and uh, community members will understand uh, quite a bit to the point where, you know, at uh, dinner parties or wherever they're talking with their friends and family, they're going to be the expert now on what's going on with uh, their child's head shape. So we're gonna kind of uh, demystify a lot of this uh, for everybody. And uh, it's wonderful that we're gonna have this available online for reference later on. If something is a little bit too quick now, or if there are other questions, always can come back and reference these issues. So we're gonna get into one of my favorite topics. And it's a good thing that I became a pediatric neurosurgeon because I like talking about uh, what we can find and what we can do to make baby's heads perfect. So what are the different types of abnormal head shapes in infants and, and what can we do to treat them? So when I was thinking about this topic, there are basically five different categories, which I think will over give an overview of 95% of plus of the different types of abnormalities that we'll see with children's heads. So looking through our list here, um, it's going down in, in some degree to uh, from the most common to the least common. And uh, we'll start with plagiocephaly. Plagiocephaly literally means in Latin an oblique head. So the baby is laying on one side of the head versus the other, and we get a little flatness on the head. And this is a very common thing. And you may have had friends or family members that um, you know may discuss, oh, my baby's head, they always seem to lay on the right side when they're sleeping and it looks a little flat. Should I go see a neurosurgeon or should I go see my primary care doctor? Or even when you're talking to the pediatrician, the discussion that you have with them about whether there should be a further evaluation by a neurosurgeon, something to do to treat it. So we will demystify a lot of that. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is craniosynostosis. So babies' skulls are individual pieces and together over time, they fuse to make uh, the skull as we have in as, a, as an adult, a completely solid piece of bone um, that all of the little fragments are now connected. So at times when the baby skulls are forming, there could be connections that are made very early and that can change the shape of a baby's skull and can also put pressure on the brain, something a little bit more concerning than plagiocephaly. And you really need a, an expert that understands the uh, formation of the skull to be able to tell the difference between these, two, these first two conditions. Uh, then we get into things like cephalohematomas, where there's a traumatic event, maybe even during birth, where there could be a little bleeding under the baby's scalp, and understanding how that forms, how it can be treated, and what it means for the child's development, I think, is very important. 
Then we get into some things that are a little bit less common, but things that you know we as, uh, as neurosurgeons and uh, neurosurgery team members will see all the time. Something called hydrocephalus, which is water on the brain, but really the pressure from that fluid within the head that can expand and grow the skull. Uh, and that would be a symmetric growth of the skull. That's an extremely dangerous condition if it's not treated and can lead to permanent um, neurological injury or permanent brain injury and something that needs to be evaluated and treated by a neurosurgeon fairly quickly. Then finally, we get into more localized um, lesions or abnormalities where there could be an abnormal growth of a particular part of the bone or something um, that sits on top of the bone, like a, a little tumor. Uh, these are more localized, more focal, but also will continue to grow and will continue to cause problems for the skull and ultimately the brain if they're not evaluated and treated in a timely manner. So this is our framework for today. And if we go through and in a very straightforward, very simple language discuss and everybody can understand what these conditions are, you're going to know an overwhelming amount of information where you would be able to understand what's going on with any infant that you see that may have an abnormally uh, shaped head. So as we get into number one, the most common, positional plagiocephaly. Plagio means oblique. One side is longer than the other. There's an asymmetry between two, two different sides of the head. And cephaly, we'll see a couple of times today, means head. That's it. So how does it happen? Um, deformational plagiocephaly, where something is deforming the skull, or posterior positional plagiocephaly, when the baby is laying on the posterior or the back part of their head, and there's a positional pressure um, on one side of the head versus the other, this can cause there to be an abnormally shaped head. And if we look at the bottom right image, we see that this baby has flattening on the back right side of their head compared to the left side. And you can get a quite asymmetric appearance to the head as a result. This is very common. In fact, it, it occurs in one in 300 infants. And in our clinic, we see maybe 10 or 20 patients a day that have this condition. Um, it's more common on the right side, like that bottom right image. Um, and it can be more common in, in males as well. This asymmetry or distortion, distortion of the skull is from external forces, from laying down on a certain side pushing those bones that are not connected, which then allow them to shift from one side to the other. And this happens from prolonged resting on that side of the head. The position can lead to cranial deformation. The skull can be deformed and flattened, like we're looking on that image to the right. And uh, if your baby's head looks like the image on the left, we've got serious problems. Come see me as soon as possible. Um, so how do the baby's skulls form? Um, if we're looking at the two images on the left, they're all disconnected pieces. And over time, they on the right, they grow from one center and they grow outward. And then they meet the most, uh, the closest bone to them. And then those bones connect. And then all of the bones eventually connect and become solid. And this deformation, the plagiocephaly, can only happen when the bones are disconnected. When they are connected, they're going to be in, in contact with each other. They're not going to be able to move one side against the other. So a lot of this can only happen when uh, the, the child is young enough. And usually about one year of age is where the bones close and won't be able to move anymore. So it's very critical that we evaluate this problem early and we can treat it before the bones close. Because if not, that head shape can be permanent for life. So this is exactly what we're talking about. When the babies lay right in the middle of their heads, um, they are less likely to get this flattening, but when they have preference to one side, like that middle image, you can absolutely get flattening on one side to the other. And sometimes, rarely, even the infants that are laying in the exact middle of their heads, they can flatten both sides of the head, and that's called brachycephaly. But essentially, it's the same thing that's going on, and you get a really flat head. If you look at the contour of that baby under the brachycephaly panel, very flat and tall head. And you can imagine that that causes a lot of distress for parents to ensure that that head shape can be corrected. And when you come and see us, we'll do everything we can to help you to correct that. So why did this happen? So in about in 1994, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, was concerned about this condition called SIDS or sudden infant death syndrome. When babies are laid on their stomachs, there's a chance that they could suffocate. And a few infants, unfortunately, died as a result of this. So they said, broadly, every infant should be laying on the back of their head, this back-to-sleep program in 1994. 
And you can imagine as a result, the level of the rate of SIDS went down. So less infants were dying from this suffocation from being positioned on their stomachs. However, a lot more developed plagiocephaly to the point where the number of plagiocephaly cases as seen on the blue line exponentially shot up because all the infants now were being put on the back of their heads. So we're getting into this position, this situation where we went from uh, from a 400% to a 900% increase in plagiocephaly. Before only 8% of infants had this plagiocephaly. After this back to sleep program, 47%, nearly 50% of kids have this. And there was an average increase of 20% every single year as this program uh, became more and more popular. And it's most common in four month old infants. So you know, as Doc Brown said, great Scott, this is becoming a problem. So we need to evaluate and see what's going on. So what happens, you know, previously when we saw these infants having flattening on the back of their head, we thought it was just a minor condition. It was cosmetic, man, we don't need to do anything. So what, they're not dying from SIDS and they get a little flatness on the back of their head, not a big deal. But, you know, as we're doing more research, as we're seeing these children get older, it's actually not necessarily the case. One, no question, it causes parental anxiety. And I think, you know, dad's anxiety level will probably be about a one or a two. Mom's going to be 300 to 400, but that's how it works. And that's great. Um, but, you know, this is something that both parents and, and all parents uh, should be concerned about because there is a potential. Now, it's not shown very clearly in the literature, but there's a potential that there could be some developmental delays when the flattening is very, very severe. Um, you know, treatments that we instill, are they take a lot of time. They can take several months to, to work through, and even some of the treatments can be a little costly. Thankfully, insurance has started to pay for a lot of these treatments, so this isn't a burden that we're putting on the families, but in the past they were. And while, you know, these complications, um, you know, can happen in terms of developmental delays from flattening on one side of the head, of course, they're still far outweighed by the risks of, of SIDS, of death. So we accept these risks because the alternative can be much more severe. So what are the risk factors? Um, you know, in, in children that have much limited head rotation, they're always going to one side. And the second term is called torticollis. And young parents hear this term very frequently from their pediatricians. And all that means is that muscles of the neck limit the movement of the child. And they might be tighter on one side and they're always forcing the child to want to lay on the one side of the head that then creates and, and facilitates a process that makes the flattening worse and worse and worse. So when they're not moving as much, when they're favoring one side to the other, of course, when they're being put on the back side of their head with this back to sleep program, all of these are contributing to um, the problem that we're seeing with the plagiocephaly. And an overwhelming amount can have limitations of the neck um, movement, and that can be associated with it. This slide I'll just leave for others to kind of look um, on the video later on, but there's a whole wealth of different predisposing factors from socioeconomic factors, factors with mom, factors with the baby, and then factors of mom caring for the baby that can cause this uh, flattening of the head to occur more likely. So early diagnosis is critical. If you're concerned, bring it up to your pediatrician and advocate for them to send you over to see us if you are really concerned in the flattening of the head. It's not something that requires a doctor's eye to see. Parents will see it. They'll say, listen, the right backside of my baby's head is completely flat. Please send me to, uh, to an expert to be able to evaluate this. Um, when we see you, of course, we get a very thorough and detailed history from the members of our team. We do a physical examination. And these exams, um, and we examine the front, the back, and the top view of the head, which will give us a sense of whether these, um, this is actually a flattening because of the positioning. And the, all of these evaluations should be done every single visit with us or with your pediatrician up to about a year of age when those bones close and lock together permanently. Getting old pictures. I always ask the families if they're able to take uh, show me old pictures or take pictures now so when we start our treatment, we can see what's going on um, in the future. So what does this exactly look like? So ipsilateral means the same side as the flattening. Contralateral means the opposite side of the flattening. So when we look at the picture on the bottom right there, the baby is laying on the right side of the back part of the head. What does that do? That moves the bones on the forehead forward. So that same side of the forehead is going to be bulging out a little bit more. 
It also moves the bone where their ear is situated. That ear is going to be pushed forward compared to the ear on the other side. And when the back part of the head gets flattened, the other side bulges out also. So these are very classic things that we look for in clinic, but not anything that we're the only ones that can see. The parents can see this too and understand if this is exactly what's going on or not. And we do measurements to see where the, the flat side, the diagonal measurement from the flat side compares to the diagonal measurement from the not flat side. And they should be equal. And when they're not equal on the image on the left, that's when we're concerned that there's uh, flattening from one side to the other. So we talked about torticollis a little bit, where no one spent a lot of time on it, but torticollis is essentially weakness of the neck muscles on one side, making the baby more likely to lay on that side or the opposite side. It can be seen in almost 16% of newborns, but when you look at newborns that have plagiocephaly, it's almost one in four of them, 25% of them. And what do we do? We massage those neck muscles, we stretch them, and we um, have the occupational therapist work with the babies to try to relieve and release the tension on those muscles so that they can go on either side and they don't favor one side compared to the other. What do we do with plagiocephaly? And again, I highlight this early treatment is essential. Once those bones are locked by one year of age, that is it. We're not going to get changes to the head shape. So we got to be evaluating. We got to see you guys soon. Common management options are repositioning therapy. Not a fancy name for anything that's beyond, you know, what families can do. We are concerned because the baby is laying on one side and flattening the head. So we reposition to the other side. That's all, nothing fancy. We have the children lay on the opposite side to try to put a little pressure on that part of the head and even things out a little bit more. If that doesn't work at a young age, then we consider doing a helmet. And we'll talk a lot more about what helmeting is and how that works for children. But again, early treatment is essential. The age at the initial visit is gonna impact how much you're gonna get correction on that as the head shape. And of course the severity when we see you at that first visit has a big role in, in determining how much correction we'll get. So repositioning is one of the most conservative and one of the best ways that we can get the child um, to improve um, with the head shape. Early initiation and milder cases, we can get complete resolution. If there's more severe flattening and we start way later than we should, we're not gonna get complete correction. And we start with the repositioning. If that doesn't work and there is severe flattening on one side of the head still, then we'll talk about helmet. And usually we start that about um, five to six months of age. And the, again, the earlier we do, the better the things um, happen, in a, the, the better the outcomes later on. And we use the helmets for about three to four months. So if we start at about six months, by nine or 10 months, we should be finishing up. The helmets need to be on for 23 hours a day. The baby's head is growing microscopically every single day and all throughout the day. The helmet has a perfect shape to it and the baby's head grows into that perfect shape. So areas that are bulging out are snug right up against the helmet and they don't grow. Areas that are flat have extra space and they grow in to fill in that space. Um, and this is some of the correction we can get from the left image to the right. There could be substantial improvement to the head shape with helmeting if the repositioning doesn't work. And I always talk to patients and families about this type of picture. You put an apple, a round apple into a square plastic container. In time, it will grow and the container will mold the head into a square. You get a square apple. The same thing is happening to the baby's head. Where there's flattening, there's extra space to grow into that space and to give you give us a perfectly round shape that is idealized for that patient. Um, so even though there's no standardized management plan for these children, the most effective way to treat these patients are to give caretakers and parents the knowledge to know exactly what we're talking about right now. And now you all have this knowledge to seek treatment early on and to get these treatments started, whether it be repositioning, that we talk about in detail and little tips and tricks to make it more effective. Or if that doesn't work, or if it's severe, we go right to a helmet. And all of these things um, will correct the head shape, but you gotta come to us. We have to know that that's what's going on. Studies have shown only 55% of mothers that give birth know to do this. And only 26% at two months of age 
even know anything about the repositioning that's critical for improving the head shape in their infants. So doing talks like this, being given the opportunity to talk about this is so critically important. So just very briefly, what our, our, our management plan is before four months of age, we work on repositioning and physical therapy if there is torticollis. If we're getting up to about six months of age, if the condition is mild or moderate, we just continue with the repositioning. If it's severe and not responding to the repositioning, then we go to a helmet. If they're older than six months and it's still moderate to mild, then we can still consider doing the positioning or jumping to a helmet. And then if it's severe, no matter what age, we're gonna go to a helmet. And this is the protocol we follow in our clinic. Nothing fancy, nothing secretive. The more information you know, the better. So outcomes with repositioning, physical therapy, and the use of helmets um, are phenomenal. By us doing this early on, there is a chance, there's a good chance that there will be complete correction, but we can't guarantee for every child that there will be a complete correction. But if we start early enough, there will absolutely be a substantial improvement in the head shapes. There's no significant complications, no significant risks. And, you know, although not every single infant, again, will be 100%, we will get very close with overwhelming majority of patients. And the more research we have about this, the more we refine these techniques, the better. So what are the future directions for plagiocephaly? We need large educational campaigns. And today is what it fits into that uh, bullet point. And I'm glad to be able to be talking to everybody. Um, we need the families to know to seek treatment sooner. We need to destigmatize the use of helmets. I mean, if we don't know what helmets are and we see a kid in a helmet on the street, we think something negative or there's some serious clinical or, or brain condition going on. That is not the case. More people know about helmets, the less it's stigmatized and the more likely parents will be comfortable using it. We need to do more research to understand how development is affected by plagiocephaly. We need to understand more about the genetics or the, or the DNA in ourselves that can predispose babies to get plagiocephaly. And we really need to develop more accurate, accessible and reliable measurement tools to measure how the correction is happening over time. And that's something that we're doing here at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. We're using three dimensional imaging in an app on your cell phone where you can take a three dimensional picture of your child's head and you can move it around, you can look exactly at what the head shape looks like. And we take multiple images of, of, of your child's head at different points in time in treatment. And this allows us to really get the best three-dimensional image of what's going on with the baby's head shape. And guess what? At the end of treatment, at the beginning of treatment, we can overlap the images and we can see exactly what our treatment has done and how much improvement there's been. Um, there aren't other centers in the country doing this. We're leading the charge on this. And uh, I think it's gonna really change how we treat uh, plagiocephaly in the future. And just some of the 3D images that we can get from some of our patients in the operating room, I mean, they're super detailed and they really provide a wealth of information for us. So now moving on to another condition called craniosynostosis. Cranio, skull, sino, together, osis is bones. So we talked about the bones of the skull for babies be individual pieces that slowly work to come together at about one year of age. Sometimes those bones in different sections can rapidly come together while the other ones are opened. And when those lock up, they can change the shape of the growth of the head. The baby's head can't grow normally because some of the bones are locked together. And that can be a serious problem for pressure on the brain or for cosme cosmetic, cosmesis, cosmetics in the future. Um, and so, as we said, it's a premature closure of the cranial bones before the age of two. It can occur in one in 2,500 births, and the sutures or the connections between the bones become locked while the rest of the skull is growing, and that deforms the skull, more likely to happen in males. Some of the problems that can happen with it, increased pressure in the head, the eyes or the orbital uh, or the orbits can be abnormally uh, located and situated, there can be a significant cosmetic issue. Hydrocephalus or water pressure on the brain can result from a very severe craniosynostosis. Developmental delays can occur, and there can be a restriction of normal brain, uh, brain growth. So we need to consider evaluation by a neurosurgeon, but also a very detailed developmental evaluation for these children. 
And this is a, a zoomed in cartoon of two different pieces of the bone. And in between them are a wealth of different hormones, different chemicals that regulate how soon and when they close and, and lock each other up. And this is, you know, a tiny fraction of the different types of molecules that are involved. We don't need to obviously get into any detail here, but this is just to show you that there's all kinds of back and forth and different interactions between these chemicals that can either lead to uh, the suture remaining open or patent or closure at the bottom of the image. And they're going constantly back and forth. When one side gets too active and takes over, it goes right to closure of the bones and that can cause the problem that we're talking about. When these bones are still open, they grow away from where their connections are. So the bones that connect right in the middle of the head, if they're open, they let the head grow wide. The bones over the front part of the head, if they're open, they let the head grow long. And when we're getting closure of the bones, let's say the bones in the middle here are closed, it doesn't let the head grow outward. It doesn't let it go from side to side outward. So it's stuck in that position. The only way it can grow is front to back and you get a really long head as a, res as a result. And the name for this condition, while you can have closure of the bones, craniosynostosis, only when it starts to deform the head can you get a condition from that where the head deformation is the name of that condition. So when kids get really long heads like this, very narrow and long heads, it's called scaphocephaly. And scapho means boat. That's kind of how we call this from many, many um, you know generations before, but that's unfortunately what the, the head shape starts to look like. When the bones on the front part of the head, the front and back are closed, they get locked in this direction. They can't grow from front to back. So the only place to grow is side to side. So we get what's called a brachycephaly, that the head becomes very tall and, and short, and it's wide on the side because these bones here are locked in. The baby can't grow their head front to back. You can get a metopic synostosis on the forehead. We have two bones here. When those close up, they bring those two forehead bones in and we get a triangular shape to the head. And that's called trigonocephaly, triangular head. And that can also be quite disfiguring. It brings the eyes inward. It causes very uh, deep grooves to result on the sides of the, on the temples and can be quite disfiguring. When one of the bones on the back of the head gets locked, it could be called a lambdoid. That's the connection, the lambdoid suture, and can cause um, something called uh, something that looks like positional plagiocephaly. This is where your doctor needs to send you to a neurosurgeon to understand the difference between just laying on one side of the head and again flattening there, or the bones are actually locked here, and that's causing the bone to look flattened on that side. And we'll talk about the difference, but that is a key differentiating point. When plagiocephaly happens from just laying flat on the head, that's something that we use repositioning for, a helmet. When craniosynostosis happens, in, like in this picture, and the bones are locked in the back of the head, that may require surgery. And knowing the difference can be hugely important because treating one condition with the other treatment plan will not do anything and can make the condition a lot worse. So, you know, this is just a general picture that all of the bones and the connections of those bones can be closed and based on where they're closed, that's the different head shape that you can get. So looking at the difference between craniosynostosis and plagiocephaly, on the left is the plagiocephaly. The bone is flattened from laying on one side. The ear gets pushed forward from that pressure. The forehead gets pushed forward from that pressure. But when we talk about craniosynostosis, we talk about the bones being pulled in and locked together. So the difference is now the ear gets pulled backwards on that flat side. The forehead gets pulled backwards on that flat side. And that is critically important to evaluate because the patient on the right will need surgery to get a normal head shape. The patient on the left just gets repositioning in a helmet. So seeing your neurosurgeon and, and the neurosurgical team is critically important to understand the difference here. So surgery is the treatment for craniosynostosis. Those bones are locked. There isn't a pill, there isn't a helmet that will unlock them. And if the formation of the skull is severe and it's not equal at all and the parents are concerned, we talk about doing surgery to release those bones and to reorganize the head shape. The earlier it's done, the better. Continuing brain growth, 
um, in this locked state can cause problems for treat for patients. And when the bones get older, they become thicker and less able to be reorganized better during surgery. Later surgery can also cause problems with other bones of the face and on the back of the skull as well. We don't do surgery for anybody, for everybody. We talk about it with the families and we make the decision always together. Surgical correction can be entirely changing the head shape or just finding where those bones are closed and opening them specifically. And you know, between the difference of the two, um, we can get into in much more detail during a clinic visit. I don't think we need to go in excruciating detail now, but essentially if we just do a minimally invasive approach, we just open where the bones are closed in the middle. We take some bone on either side where they're closed, we open it up and we allow that bone, the skull to then form in a nor more normal way. The only things with this is that we have to put the patients in helmets afterwards. We wanna make sure that the head shape is, is continued to be improved afterwards when those bones are opened. Um, the surgery is done earlier. Um, there is, uh, it's less invasive, but it also can cause problems with some of the veins um, during surgery. So there's a little bit more risk with that surgery, even though it's a less intensive surgery than the, the bigger surgery we'll talk about in a minute. In a minute. Um, and then rarely those bones that we open can close again. So there are risks that things can go back to where they were even with those surgeries. When we do an open correction, we get immediate results. There's no need for a helmet. The correction is much more robust. We can control it much better. And in, our, in my opinion, has better outcomes. Um, but, our, but we do have to wait for the children to be over six months. They're bigger, they can deal with the surgery better. There's a little bit longer of an OR time and hospital stay. The surgery itself may take about four or five hours. You may be in the hospital for only three or four days compared to the other surgery, maybe one or two days, but different patients need different surgeries. And we talk about all these risks and benefits together when we're discussing what to do. This is now hopefully not too gruesome of an image, but we reorganize all these bones just like this in surgery and the heads look phenomenal afterwards. We even integrate some of our computerized models to be able to plan the surgery before we even get into the operating room. And our team published some of the research that is leading the way in being able to do this. Um, and we get results like this, where the, the baby at the top of the uh, panels there in, in B has a very long, elongated head, if we look all the way to the right. But then in the middle image on the bottom, we have a much more normal head shape after surgery. And um, you know, this is a young man that has trigonocephaly. And if you look on the left side, on the bottom image, he has a bone that sticks out from the middle. On the top panel, he has a kind of pointed triangular head shape there. After surgery, much more round. After And then on the frontal view of him, the head is much more flat, much better uh, outcome for him. So that's craniosynostosis. We'll talk about cephalohematomas. Cephalo skull hematoma is a blood clot. So blood can accumulate under the scalp, and that can happen after birth can happen, God forbid, if the baby um, has head trauma, falls. Um, and that's something where the skull and the skin kind of slide over each other and can tear some of the blood vessels that are in that area. The bleeding is gradual, therefore you might not see it immediately after both, or it can happen over time. And it can happen up to 2.5% of live births and more common in males. So if we look at the right side of the image there, um, on the top of the skull, the skull is this area here. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow, but there are three where three locations where blood can accumulate on the skin over the bone. And one is this caput saxodanium, which is just a swelling of the skin that can happen immediately after birth and it goes away in a few days. Subgaleal hematoma is in the layer, the, the layer of the, the deepest layer of the skin but not necessarily in the layer of tissue right over the bone, that can spread pretty far and be pretty expansive on the skull and is something that we do need to monitor very, very closely because the baby can lose a lot of blood in that area on the scalp. We're talking about cephalohematomas there. There's a very thin layer of tissue that sits immediately on top of the bone, and that's where the cephalohematomas can occur. Um, the, we talked about the cephalohematomas and differentiating the two, and it's something that we will help with in clinic. Um, but babies that have the cephalohematomas can have this as a result of a prolonged second stage of labor. If the baby is very big relative to the birth canal, um, weak contractions from the uterus can cause um, bleeding on the baby's scalp, abnormal presentation of where the baby is located in the uterus. 
Um, if the instruments need to be used to help the baby's head out, to come out, forceps, a vacuum, always a question that we'll ask families. Twins are more likely to set up for the cephalic hematomas, as well as C-section that happens after the first stage of labor. And the treatment are primarily observational. This is blood that accumulates under the skin. And what I've been having my patients do is massage that area. That blood will then get absorbed over time into the body and will get removed and it'll be like it was never there. If it is not massaged, if we just leave it there, it will harden and it will become almost like bone. Um, it can take a few weeks to resorb and reabsorb into the body. But if it's not, nothing's being done, it will calcify. And calcium is the main uh, structure, that the main uh, molecule that we have in our bones. If it doesn't get massaged away and, and it, if it doesn't go away, it's going to be like a big lump of bone sitting on the baby's skull and it could be pretty deforming. And this is a CAT scan of a baby that has a big cephalohematoma. You see this huge lump that was old blood that formed after birth sat there, we didn't, um, this patient's family didn't massage it away. We didn't see them until it was too late. And they now have a huge lump on their head. So it, it hardens or ossifies and it won't be absorbed at that point. It's unfortunate. So when indicated, if we can't massage it away, if it's already hardened, we sometimes can do surgery to shave it down to get it to be a beautiful contour that'll match the other side of the head. Um, we just shave down that bone if needed. Again, it's not necessarily going to put pressure on the brain. It's not necessarily going to cause developmental problems. But if we have a cosmetic concern, because the surgery is so safe and so straightforward, it takes an hour. You got your home in a day or two. Uh, your your home an hour or two afterwards, same day. Um, it's something that we can do to provide a better cosmetic uh, result for our patients. All right, we'll go on to hydrocephalus. This is what hydrocephalus can do, unfortunately, to a baby's head. And hydrocephalus means water on the brain. And that's a mismatch between the CSF or the cerebrospinal fluid production and absorption. Um, the Anywhere along the normal pathways where the spinal fluid flows, if they're blocked, that fluid starts to build up. It's not being absorbed, but it's constantly being made. And that can make baby's heads grow substantially larger. And the arrows are where all this fluid needs to move around in fluid spaces in the brain. If any of these very thin areas are blocked, that fluid will accumulate and it'll grow on the baby's head and it'll make the baby's head grow like a balloon. 80% um, is, is produced in a part of the brain called the choroid plexus, but the spinal fluid is essentially an ultra filtrate, a filter of the blood and the plasma. And that's where the spinal fluid is made. And ultimately, after it circulates all around our brains and spine, it gets reabsorbed in the veins on the top of the brain, and it goes back into the blood. And that's the whole cycle of the spinal fluid. Infants will make about 50 milliliters per day, and adults will make about 150 milliliters to, per day of the spinal fluid, meaning that two or three times a day, all of that fluid in the head is being reproduced. If it's blocked, then it will grow two to three times every single day. And that can be very, very dangerous. Um, this is what we talked about, the circulation, and it gets reabsorbed on the top of the brain. Um, another image of that and microscopically showing a, a cartoon of how it gets absorbed on these areas on the top of the brain. And when it builds up and it's not being absorbed, that buildup of fluid will cause pressure on the brain. And that brain pressure can cause brain damage can cause permanent or temporary uh, brain damage to the point where it can cause weakness, numbness, coma states, can cause developmental concerns, can be very, very serious. Um, so what happens is the spinal fluid volume increases. It's not being removed into the blood. It compresses the veins even further. It compresses the brain. It raises the pressure, the intracranial pressure or pressure in the head and that can cause brain herniation or squeezing out from any possible where, any possible location, it can find space. And that will damage and can kill that brain tissue. Um, we get ultrasounds for our babies. If it's serious, we can get an MRI. And we evaluate, of course, the fontanelle. The fontanelle is an open spot on the top of the head. And if it's bulging up, that could be a sign that there is, in fact, pressure on the head. Babies will present with vomiting, 
not necessarily headaches. They're not going to be able to tell us that, but they can hold their heads. They can be extremely irritable and give us a signal that maybe there is headache pressure. Uh, their eyes, for some reason, based on the anatomy, their eyes are not able to look up well. And we get a baby like that middle panel where the eyes are sunken down called sunsetting eyes. That could be another sign that we see. Bradycardia or low heart rate. The brain is pushing against the blood that's coming up. The heart rate slows down. And the, finally, the baby can be lethargic, can go into a coma. This is very, very serious. We need to watch that. On that middle graph over there, that's the head circumference, the measurement of the whole size of the head. And those little dots are showing that the head is growing off of the charts. That's another sign that this can be going on. Um, we talked about some of the symptoms. I'll leave this on for a second for those who are watching the video later to go in more detail. Otherwise, treatment, we can give some medications that reduce the amount of fluid on the brain, but mostly we're going to have to take that fluid and send it somewhere else if the body is not able to absorb it by itself. And what that means is putting a series of tubes in the body. One tube goes into the fluid spaces during surgery while the child is completely asleep. And we only take this risk of doing these tubes if the risk of not doing them is greater, that the brain will be suffering as a result. So there's one tube that goes into the fluid space. It that comes on the outside of the skull. It connects to a valve, which regulates the pressure and how much fluid stays in and how much fluid comes out. And then the other end is connected to a tube that then goes into the belly. And that belly is where the fluid is being absorbed ultimately. We're shunting, or a shunt means taking something from one place to another. We're taking that fluid from the brain and we're putting it into the belly it gets absorbed back into the blood from the belly, and then the whole cycle goes all over again. Sometimes people may have problems with their bellies. They have an old infection there. They have a ton of scar tissue. It can't be absorbed if we need to. Sometimes we even put that other tube into the heart, and it goes right into the bloodstream. It is safe. We have many patients that we manage for many, many years that have these shunts in the heart, and we take that risk of putting something into the heart because if we don't do it, they're going to have significantly more problems with the pressure from on their heads. So very rarely, some kids can have some fluid on the top of their skulls, not from within pushing out. And it's called benign external hydrocephalus or BESS, E-E-S-S. -S. This is something where it can cause growth of the head, but it is benign. The first word there, up front, benign. They do not need treatment for this. We will still see you in clinic. We will determine for you that this is going on and we will reassure you that you do not need any treatment um, as a result of this. It's self-limited. We do not need to do anything. It can be a normal variant for treatment. Um, while it can cause a large head, again, it doesn't need to be, it, we don't need to do any intervention for this and come to us, see us. We will t inform you about what's going on and we'll help you manage this. Very quickly, we'll just talk about skull lesions. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of skull lesions that can happen. Primarily, it's going to be in a very isolated, localized area in the, in the scalp compared to a lot of the other things that we previously just talked about. Um, a dermoid or an epidermoid, derm means skin, um, and that is when skin cells, normal skin cells, which we have on the surface of our skin and get wiped off all day, we don't even notice it as they're being made over, made over and over, those skin cells can get trapped deep inside the skin underneath it by the skull. And they grow like normal skin, but they don't have anywhere to go. So it's normal skin cells that get trapped very, very deep. And it just becomes this growing lump on your child's head. It is concerning because it wears away the bone underneath and it can ultimately come and push on the brain. And this bottom right image here um, is what it looks like. It's just a growing lump on the scalp. And that needs to be taken out. It's not going to stop. It's going to continue to get bigger. It's going to stretch the skin. It's going to erode the bone underneath. And it can cause serious problems. Um, similar to, to that, the middle image there in A, um, an osteoma is a tumor of the bone. So in the same way, a lump can form from those bone cells or osteocytes being abnormal. And they will continue to grow like a lump. And the same way can cause pressure on the brain. Both need to be diagnosed by us, and they will not go away without surgery. Thankfully, surgery is quick, safe. We have excellent outcomes in our clinic, extremely low infection rates, and patients are home that same day, a couple of hours. Um, and in terms of pain control, in terms of going back to normal life, 
one or two days, that's it. And this problem is never something that you need to worry about. Again, we are more than happy to do that for families. So in conclusion, asymmetry of your baby's head can be the result of benign positional issues, plagiocephaly, or more serious things like craniosynostosis. Come to us. We will talk to you about every detail of what's going on with your baby's head, and we will allow you to tell the difference in very straightforward way between these two, something that needs more intensive treatment and something that doesn't necessarily need that. Birth or later trauma can cause what we talked about, cephalohematomas or other collections of blood under the scalp. Massaging can treat these by getting them to be reabsorbed into the body. But sometimes if it's severe, it's disfiguring. We have options, very straightforward surgical procedures that you're here for two hours, three hours for. You go home and the head is now perfectly symmetric. Um, abnormal enlargement of the skull can be due very dangerously. This is the big dangerous condition of hydrocephalus. And that's after the brain is completely squashed on the skull, then the skull starts to grow. So we're sacrificing the viability and the health of the brain in this condition. So this is one where we absolutely need to see you right away. And that's going to be growth of the head in all dimensions and all of the other symptoms we talked about. Finally, there's so many different little scalp lesions. If you notice any abnormal lump, bump, anything unusual, discoloration of the skin over an area that has a little bump, come to see us. We will see you anytime, and we are more than happy to explain exactly what's going on in, in a lot of detail, in language that everybody can understand, so that you will feel comfortable being an advocate for your child and discussing with us a plan together of what we can do to best care for your child. So... Let's keep those heads round. Let's keep them symmetric. Let's keep those brains healthy. We're going to dispel the flat head theory. Um, and uh, we are always here to help you anytime you need us. Um, call us uh, at the office. Send me an email. We're happy to see you and really appreciate the invitation and all of your time and attention. So I hope now you're all experts on babies' head shapes. Well, Dr. Kovitz, what a great presentation. Even wants me to be a neurosurgeon now, even myself. And this was so educational. It's amazing. Thank you so much for everything that you do and all the knowledge that you've certainly shared today. I'm going to make sure that this spreads widely because I think for a lot of parents, grandparents, and even those that don't have babies, it's good to know all this information. So thank you so much. And I wish we had more time because I have a couple of questions and I'm glad that one of them is shared by one of our attendees. And, and please send all your questions too because we only have so many more minutes with Dr. Kovitz here. So what would be the position that you suggest that we put our babies to sleep? Should we go back to belly sleeping? I, you know, this the concern for belly sleeping and SIDS is real. So I'm not going to say that that should be the position. The answer to that is there should not be one position. That's okay. it. We should be alternating. We should be doing side to side. We should be doing back. We should be doing left. We should be doing right. The problem happens when there's a consistent position that's done every single time the baby's laying down, every single time the baby's put in a car seat, every single time mom is holding the baby to feed them. As long as you alternate, that's the best way to prevent this condition from happening. Okay. Um, and I wrote some questions down. So talking about plagiocephaly, does it have any effect on intelligence or development? So um, they've looked at this in a lot of detail in literature, in many different types of studies. And when it's very, very severe, like there's a complete shift of one head to the other, um, they can see developmental problems. The issue with this, though, is it's a chicken and the egg type of problem. Did the baby have developmental issues? And as a result, they're not moving their head enough and changing positions. And that's why they get the plagiocephaly. Or is it the other way around? The plagiocephaly limits their movement. And be, uh, the, and, and they, because of the plagiocephaly, um, they're having these developmental issues. The thought is that the former, that the babies that have developmental issues are more likely to get the plagiocephaly, but the plagiocephaly itself won't cause developmental issues. So when we talk about these issues with parents, straight up, right from the start, I want them to be comfortable. I don't want them to be stressed. 
we say that this is not going to have a significant effect on your baby's development. If your baby has developmental issues already, then it could play into this. But if your baby is fine in our visit, doesn't have any developmental concerns, it's highly unlikely that the flattening will cause any issues in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, talking about those helmets, do they hurt the babies? So the helmets are made custom for every single child. When we send a referral for one of our patients to get a helmet, we have many different companies that we work with and we find one that's convenient for where the family lives so they don't really have to travel far to get it. And we make sure that their insurance pays for it completely. So families do not need to worry about cost or getting to those centers. They do laser measurements of the baby's heads. And for your specific child, they find where the flattening is and they make a custom helmet for you. Sometimes if the helmets are a little bit tight, it can cause some irritation on the skin. But once we identify that, the helmet is made out of styrofoam. The company can shave out a little bit of the inside to make more space for the baby's head. And the baby's heads will continue to grow. So as we're using the helmet, we shave it progressively to accommodate to the baby's head to make it comfortable. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, when baby starts walking and becoming a little uh, troublemaker, parents mm -hmm. love the fact that now they have a, a helmet on this child to protect them from running around everywhere. And honestly too, the babies, while the first time you put it on for five minutes, they're uncomfortable. After that five minutes, they love it. It's snug, it's secure. It keeps them in this little cozy area. Kids cry sometimes when they take it off. Um, and you know, it, it, it's not a problem to have them stay on and it doesn't really cause significant issues with the skin or they're not too tight because they're made specifically for your baby. Okay, thank you. Um, craniosynostosis, I was trying oh, to perfect. write it down. Um, what causes the craniosynostosis? So rarely, if multiple bones are connected, there can be syndromes or genetic changes in our DNA that can make those things happen. But that only happens about 20% of the times we see craniosynostosis. Overwhelmingly, there's no genetic link to it. It's not passed from family to family. Just in those microscopic areas between those bones, some of the chemicals get over, overwhelming. They get too, uh, too concentrated there. And that's what causes the rapidity of the connection. But we don't have a great answer for many of the reasons that it happens. And uh, there is not, unfortunately, any, any way to stop that chemically or to do injections, nothing like that. Unfortunately, now when it happens, the best way to, to treat it and release it is surgically to literally release that connection of the bones. And what are the risks of that surgery? So the, the risks of the surgery, you know, we, we talk about against the benefits. Um, if the risks were severe and the benefit was only cosmetic, well, then we wouldn't be doing the surgery. Okay. Thankfully, we are one of the leading centers in the country that does this type of surgery. And we've published and taught other centers how to do the surgery based on our techniques. The risks of any surgery are infection and bleeding. And our rates are extremely low here because of good sterile technique. Um, the other risks of the surgery is the covering of the brain very rarely can have an opening on it and some of the spinal fluid can potentially leak out. Um, we haven't had that in, in hundreds of the surgeries we do, but if it does happen, we put a stitch and we close it up right away. Um, finally, um, the risk of, um, that's, that's pretty much it. Those are the risks. Um, the correction is immediate, you know, for some of the other conditions where we just open the bones, the risk is that they can close again, that the head shape may not be ideal. But when we do that bigger surgery, we get the treatment right away. So we're really looking at just spinal fluid leak, uh, infection and bleeding. And again, extremely low, I would even say less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Now moving on to hydrocephalus, is there any way to prevent hydrocephalus? So hydrocephalus prevention, unfortunately, is difficult because there are so many different reasons that hydrocephalus can happen. So there isn't one kind of magic treatment to treat all those different types of hydrocephalus. Um, the, the condition, unfortunately, if it's from a blockage, that's a mechanical blockage. The anatomy is physically blocked. The only way to, to relieve it is to either uh, remove that blockage, which is rarely something we can do because it's usually very deep in the brain, make 
a new pathway to that fluid and we have minimally invasive techniques that we're expert in that allow us in certain patients to make new pathways for the fluid to go, or unfortunately the shunt is the only thing to do. Thankfully, shunt surgery takes an hour and I guarantee as you walk down the street, anywhere you are in the world, there's people with shunts that you're passing by and you don't even know they have shunts. They live normal lives. So to be able to do this type of procedure and give families and patients completely normal lives, this is a good option for treatment. And there hasn't been, unfortunately, um, anything better to this point because people do really, really well. Um, rarely there's certain medications we can use, but again, only for one small subtype of hydrocephalus. And there's many, many different reasons that it happens. Now, the, the tubing uh, doesn't have to be changed over time as the body grows, or once it's in the body, that's it, you can't forget about it. So um, unfortunately, we never forget about them. Um, the tubing, while we put it into the belly when children are very young, we leave a lot of extra tubing in the belly. So when that grows, it doesn't get pulled out. And the head doesn't change drastically where that tubing in the head can remain for, for decades. I have patients where they've had shunts for 30, 40 years and never had any issues. I have some patients where the shunt was put in a few years ago by um, you know our predecessors and the tubing unfortunately can get disconnected, it can get broken and it can get clogged up. And it's not something that we can just say, we're not gonna worry about it. We do actively have to, excuse Monitor. Excuse me, we do actively have to monitor these patients to ensure that they're not getting their symptoms back of what happens when the fluid builds up. And we do have to fix shunts, uh, unfortunately, commonly. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Kovitz, thank you so much. I know we're running out of time, but I made all my questions. So <laughs> thank you so much. And I think I just have one more question that I think is very important for everybody. If we are concerned and we want to make an appointment, how long does it take um, to get an appointment with you or uh, another doctor in your team? So um, I think our team works by ensuring that we do not make patients wait long. So compared to some of the other centers in New York and some of the other centers in the country, we make it a, a, a point in our practice and a pride point in our practice to make sure that we see patients within a couple of weeks. Um, we want to make sure that one, parents are not stressing out over this, Two, that we can start treatment sooner um, because the sooner we do, the better outcomes we have. And we want to have this practice where they feel like they can always be in touch with us. We have a very personal connection um, to make sure that we are your doctor and whenever you need us, we will be there. And that starts from the first visit, knowing that you're not going to have to wait one, months and months and months to see us. If a pediatrician calls me and says, I am really concerned about this patient, I say, okay, I, I hear your concern, I will see them tomorrow. If I have clinic and they can come in, I will see them today. So we do not want patients waiting for us months and months and months. We will do everything we can to see you as soon as possible. Oh my God, thank you so much. And thank you for doing that because after seeing this, now I'm really concerned, you know, sometimes we don't think about it and, and look at the risks. So it's great to know that we have a doctor close to home that actually can take care of, our concerns and certainly our babies, you know, pretty much immediately. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Kovitz. And I know that we have more to learn from you. So you're gonna be coming again soon. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today. Please help us spread and disseminate this information because you see how vital it is and, and important. So we could save a life and we didn't know. So thank you so much. And I will see you next week. We're going to be talking about in case of emergency. And it's um, how to better navigate the emergency room, which everybody can learn from. So I'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Dr. Kovitz. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I'll send you the recordings later. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Have a great day.